Hello, and welcome to the recording of the virtual presentation, The Hour Has Come, hosted by the Lake Oswego Public Library's Second Wednesday Performing Arts Series. My name is Shannon Sedell. I am one of the librarians here at the library. In honor of the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, The Hour Has Come is a reader's theater piece that was adapted from a work commissioned by the National Archives. It was intended for educational purposes and was first performed on August 26, 1995. The AAUW has adapted it for an adult audience and we have five members from our local chapter to perform it for you today. Thank you so much for being here. As we approach the anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, recognizing the right of women to vote, it is important to reflect on the long, hard battle to win that right. The problem began with the words of the Founding Fathers, not the ones they put in, the ones they left out. When the Founding Fathers sat down to write the Declaration and the Constitution, they left out one critical word, women. Under common law, a married woman was not a legal autonomous person. Husband and wife were considered one person, and therefore the husband, as head of household, voted for the whole family. As time progressed, lawmakers were blatantly discriminatory. They did not want to share power with either women, freed America, African Americans, or immigrants. In 1837, South Carolina abolitionists Sarah and Angelina Grimke began a speaking tour in which they denounced the evils of slavery arguing that white women and black slaves had something in common, oppression and lack of power. They believed that to be effective against slavery, they had to have a political voice. Their actions were condemned from pulpits as contrary to God's law and outside the women's sphere. Although white women faced nowhere near the abysmal conditions of enslaved women, the legal status of married free women, white as well as black, was not all that different from that of slaves. The General Association of Massachusetts clergymen met in June of 1837 and issued a pastoral letter stating, the power of woman is in her dependence, flowing from the consciousness that weakness God has given her for her protection. But when she assumes the place and tone of a man as a public reformer, our care and protection of her seem unnecessary. We put ourselves in self-defense against her. She yields the power which God has given her for protection and her character becomes unnatural. If the vine, whose strength and beauty is to lean upon the trellis and half conceal its clusters, thinks to assume the independence and the overshadowing nature of the elm, it will not only cease to bear fruit, but fall in shame and dishonor into the dust. Sarah Grimke, in her Letters on the Equality of the Sexes and the Condition of Women, had an answer for that. She said, I ask no favors of my sex. I surrender not our claim to equality. All I ask of our brethren is that they will take their feet off our necks and, and permit us to stand upright on the ground which God has designed us to occupy. I am persuaded that the rights of women like the rights of slaves, need only to be examined to be understood and asserted. Attending the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, because they were women, were denied participation and forced to sit in a roped-off section out of sight of the male attendees. For Stanton, this event increased her resentment of oppression against women. 
1848, Stanton and Mott organized the first women's rights convention held in Seneca Falls, New York. This took great courage. In the 1840s, respectable women did not even speak in public, let alone call meetings. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said later, we felt as helpless and hopeless as if we had suddenly been asked to construct a steam engine. But they were <laughs> determined. Stanton wrote the Declaration of Sentiments based on the Declaration of Independence in which she defined grievances against men. Here is some of that declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights as a citizen the elective franchise, therefore leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation. He has oppressed her on all sides. Now, in view of this entire disenfranchisement of half the people of this country, their social and religious degradation in the view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of these United States. Many rights supporters were aghast when Stanton demanded the right to vote, believing that such a bold action would lose public support and impede the new rights movement. In July 1848, former slave, abolitionist, and statesman Frederick Douglass wrote an editorial in the North Star an anti-slavery newspaper that he published in Rochester, New York. The article was entitled, The Rights of Women. Standing as we do upon the watchtower of human freedom, we cannot be deterred from an expression of our approbation of any movement, however humble, to improve and elevate the character of any members of the human family. We are free to say that in respect to political rights, we hold women to be justly entitled to all we claim for men. We go further and express our conviction that all political rights that is expedient for men to exercise is equally so for women. All that distinguishes man as an intelligent and accountable being is equally true for women. And if that government only is just, which governs by the free consent of the governed, there can be no reason in the world for denying to women the exercise of the elective franchise or a hand in making and administering the laws of the land. Women joined with the abolitionists and called for equal rights under the law. At the 1851 <laughs> National Women's Rights Convention, abolitionist and women's rights activist Sojourner Truth spoke in favor of women voting. There's an interesting history associated with this speech. The oldest account of the speech was by Marius Robinson in the Salem Anti-Slavery Bugle. 12 years later, the most common rendering of the speech was constructed by Francis Gage in the New York Independent. This speech later became known as the Ain't I a Woman speech. I want to say a few words about this matter. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed. And can any man do more than that? I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and can eat as much too. If I can get it, 
I am strong as any man that is now. As for intellect, all I can say is, if woman have a pint and man a quart, why can't she have her little pint full? You need not be afraid to give us our rights for fear we will take too much, for we won't take more than our pint will hold. In the 1850s, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone led a group of courageous women who entered into the fight for both abolition and universal suffrage. They formed the American Equal Rights Association. When the Civil War began in 1861, suffragists deferred their campaign for the vote to give full attention to the national crisis. Annie T. Wittenmeyer was appointed superintendent of all army diet kitchens. Mary Walker served as the first female surgeon. Louisa May Alcott and thousands of other women served as nurses. Anna Ella Carroll was one of Lincoln's advisors on strategy. Following the Civil War, Congress began debating an amendment to give freed slaves the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton petitioned Congress to include women in the amendment and to prohibit disenfranchising people on the basis of sex. We represent 15 million people, one half the entire population of the country. The Constitution classes us as free people, yet we are governed without our consent, compelled to pay taxes without appeal, and punished for violations of law without choice of judge or juror. We are now amending the Constitution and placing our safeguards around the individual rights of four million emancipated slaves. We ask that you extend the right of suffrage to women, the only remaining class of disenfranchised citizens, and thus fulfill your constitutional obligation. Sojourner Truth, whose speech Ain't I a Woman, and so moved the Equal Rights Convention in 1851, spoke again in 1867 for women's right to vote. Speak for the rights of colored women. I want to keep the living, that I want to keep the thing stirring now that the ice is cracked. You have been having our rights for so long that you think like a slaveholder, that you own us. Suffragist Frances Gage wrote, 52,000 pulpits in this country have been teaching women the lesson that has been taught them for centuries, that they must not think about voting. But when 52,000 pulpits at the beginnings of this war lifted up their voices and asked of women, come out and help us, did they stand back? In every home in the whole United States, they rose up and went to work for the nation. The American Equal Rights Association, a coalition of abolitionists and suffragists, was formed in 1866. Disagreements developed over the 14th Amendment, which granted freed slaves citizenship, and the proposed 15th Amendment, which guaranteed suffrage for black males only, not women. The 1869 meeting of the group was acrimonious and the organization formally ended in 1870. Two days later, on May 15, 1869, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the National Women's Suffrage Association, NWSA. Later that year, Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe formed the American Women's Suffrage Association, AWSA. The NWSA was interested in addressing many women's issues, including divorce reform and equal pay, as well as universal suffrage, and it argued for a national constitutional amendment. The AWSA, the more conservative organization, disagreed and advocated for suffrage through amending state constitutions. It took 20 years for the two groups to settle their differences and merge into the NAWSA. This group focused its attention on obtaining suffrage in individual states. But in spite of 
efficient and the passion. The 14th and 15th Amendments were silent on the voting rights for women. Nevertheless, the suffragists would not give up. In 1869, Lucy Stone sent out an appeal to the men and women of America. Get every man or woman to sign this petition who is not satisfied while women, idiots, felons, and lunatics are the only classes excluded from the exercise of the right of suffrage. Let the great army of working women who wish to secure a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, sign it. Let the wife from whom the law takes the right to what she earns, sign it. Let the mother who has no legal right for her own children, sign it. Civil War nurse Clara Barton's suffrage convention in 1870. Brothers, when you were weak and I was strong, I toiled for you. Now you are strong and I ask your aid. I ask the ballot for myself and my sex. As I stood by you, I pray you stand by me and mine. When the Senate considered the woman question in 1872, the same tired old arguments were raised to oppose women voting. Senator Reagan of Texas said, I hope, sir, that it will not be considered ungracious in me that I oppose the will of any lady, but she so far misunderstands her duty as to want to go on working on the road and serving in the army, I want to protect her against it. Should we attempt to overturn the social status of the world as it has existed for 6,000 years? The congressman from Texas wasn't the only lawmaker who argued that if the founding fathers had meant women to vote, they would have said so directly. Elizabeth Cady Stanton responded. Women did vote in America at the time the Constitution was adopted. If the framers of the Constitution meant they should not, why did they not distinctly say so? The women of the country, having at last roused up to their rights and duties as citizens, have a word to say. It is not safe to leave the intentions of the Founding Fathers or the Heavenly Father wholly to masculine interpretation. Congress appointed a committee to study the flood of petitions arriving daily from women. Here is how Reverend L. E. Keith, better known as Felix Feeler, described the attention men paid to these petitions. Women's petitions are generally referred to a fool committee of fools carefully laid on the floor of the committee room to be a target at which to shoot tobacco juice. And the committee men who hit the mark often as disregarded as having done the most to kill the petition. Even President Rutherford Hayes remained indifferent to the poignant arguments of the suffragists. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said of President Rutherford Hayes. In President Hayes's last message, he reviews the interests of the Republic, from the Army and the Navy to the crowded conditions of the mummies, dead ducks, and fishes in the Smithsonian Institution. Yet he forgets to mention 20 million women citizens robbed of their social, civil, and political rights, resolved that a committee be appointed to wait upon the President and remind him of the existence of one half of the American people whom he has accidentally overlooked. The pioneer women who were then settling the West had no intention of being overlooked. The territory of Wyoming granted women suffrage. The neighboring territories of Utah, Colorado, and Idaho followed in 1869, 1893, and 1896, respectively. On September the 8th, 1870, Louisa Ann Swain of Laramie became the first woman to vote in the general election. When Wyoming applied for citizenship in, uh, for statehood in 1890, 
a furious block of senators opposed its admission because it allowed women to vote. The senator from Tennessee called it a reform against nature and predicted it would unsex and degrade the women of America. But Wyoming citizens refused to give in. Their legislature cabled back to Washington. We will remain out of the union a hundred years rather than come in without our women. Encouraging words, but as the years of struggle rolled by, the women of Seneca Falls realized they would not live to vote. In 1892, when she resigned from the NAWSA, Elizabeth Cady Stanton gave what is known as the Solitude of Self Address to a House Committee. The strongest reason why we ask for women's voice in the government under which she lives, in the religion she is asked to believe, equally in equality in social life where she is the chief factor, a place in the trades and professions where she may earn her bread, is because of her birthright to self-sovereignty. Because as an individual, she must not rely on her, she must rely on herself, no matter how much women prefer to lean, to be protected and supported, nor how much men desire to have them do so, they must make the voyage of life alone. And for safety in an emergency, they must know something of the laws of navigation. To guide our own craft, we must be captain, pilot, engineer, with chart and compass to stand at the wheel, to watch the wind and waves and know when to take in the sail, and to read the signs in the firmament overall. It matters not whether the solitary voyager is a man or a woman. Nature having endowed them equally leaves them to their own skill and judgment in the hour of danger. And if not equal to the occasion, alike they perish. 24 hours before she died in 1902, Stanton dictated this plea to Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. President, Abraham Lincoln immortalized himself by the emancipation of four million slaves. Immortalize yourself by bringing about the complete emancipation of 36 million women. By 1900, over 3 million women worked for wages outside the home, often in hazardous and exploitative conditions, often with their children beside them at the machinery. They needed the ballot to give them a voice in making labor laws. In 1907, Harriet Stanton Blatch formed the Equality League of Self-Supporting Women, later renamed the Women's Political Union, to recruit working class women, such as factory, laundry, and garment workers into the suffrage movement and to lobby politicians. Thinking this was a good move, the NAWSA hired unionists Rose Schneiderman and Clara Limlich to encourage working class and wage earning women to join them. In 1908, in the Mueller versus the State of Oregon case, Louis Brandeis defended Oregon's maximum working hour law for women before the U.S. Supreme Court and won. The court overturned previous court rulings. This case was important for the labor movement, but it was actually the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that became a rallying point for both the suffrage and the labor union movement. Gary Ware Dennett, suffragist, wrote, It is enough to silence forever the selfish, edel-headed drivel of the anti-suffragists who say that working women can safely trust their welfare to their natural protectors. Trust the men who allow 700 women to sit wedged between machines in a 10-story building with no outside fire escapes and the exits shuttered and locked? 
We claim in no uncertain voice that the time has come when women should have the one efficient tool which will make for themselves decent and safe working conditions, the ballot. Not all women supported the suffrage. Frightened by the power of the suffrage movement, the antis mobilized. In 1911, the National Association of Women Opposed to Suffrage had representation in 25 states. It was led by Josephine Dodge, who opposed suffrage because she thought it would damage progress made on other reforms, particularly those made by the movement she led to establish daycare centers to help working mothers. The pamphlet outlining their objections to suffrage stated, because 90% of women do not want or do not care about the right to vote, because it means there would be a competition between women and men rather than cooperation, because 80% 80 of the women eligible to are married and can only double or annul their husband's votes, because it can be of no benefit commensurate with the expense involved, because in some states there are more voting women than voting men. It would place the government under petticoat rule because it is unwise to risk the good we already have for the evil that might occur. The movement now was beginning to expand beyond white, middle, and upper class Protestant women. Working women and black women also embraced women's emancipation and participation in politics. Black rights activist, writer, and suffragist Ida B. Wells formed the Alpha Suffrage Club in 1913. With this new army of supporters, women succeeded in putting suffrage on the state's agendas. In 1912, the suffrage referendum passed in Arizona, Kansas, and Oregon. Was defeated in Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Not content with the slow progress of the suffrage efforts, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, two of the more radical suffragists, broke with the NAWSA and formed the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, the CU, in 1913. Three years later, the CU became the National Women's Party, dedicated to passing a woman's suffrage constitutional amendment at the national level. The National Women's Party authored over 600 pieces of legislation, of which 300 were passed. Sadly, Alice Paul's proposed 1923 Equal Rights Amendment did not pass. And today, still, ERA, which was approved by Congress in 1972, has not been ratified. Paul said, There will never be a new world order until women are a part of it. In 1913, over 5,000 women marched down Pennsylvania Avenue on the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, asking for the vote. They were mobbed by a hostile crowd. One of the marchers was Ida B. Wells. On the day of the parade, Wells and 60 other black women arrived to march with the Illinois delegation, but were immediately advised as women of color to march in the back so as not to upset the Southern delegations. delegation. Wells refused, arguing either I go with you or not at all. I am not taking this stand because I personally wish for recognition. I am doing it for the future benefit of my whole race. She initially left the scene convincing the crowd that she was complying with the request. However, she quickly returned and marched alongside her own Illinois delegation, supported by her white co-suffragists, Bell Squires and Virginia Brooks. This event received massive newspaper coverage and shed light on the reality for African-American participation in politics. In 1914, a suffrage referendum passed in Montana and Nevada. 
was defeated in North and South Dakota, Nebraska, and Missouri. In 1915, the suffrage referendum failed in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, the sal saloons handed out pink tickets printed with, good for two drinks if women's suffrage is defeated. In 1916, an emergency convention of the NAWAS was convened after the Republican and Democratic conventions. Members debated whether they should focus on a federal amendment, concentrate on state legislation, or continue to work on both. At the meeting, Carrie Chapman Catt gave a speech called The Crisis. I believe that a crisis has come in our movement, which, if recognized and the opportunity seized with vigor, enthusiasm, and will, means the final victory of our great cause in this very near future. The object of the life of an organized movement is to secure its aim. Necessarily, it must obey the law of evolution and pass through the stages of agitation and ed education, and finally through the stage of realization. Such a period comes to every movement and is its crisis. In my judgment, that crucial moment bidding us to renewed consecration and redoubled activity has come to our cause. I believe our victory hangs with our grasp, with, within our grasp, inviting us to pluck it out of the clouds and establish it among the good things of the world. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, women were urged once again to put aside their cause for the war effort. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter reminded them, the suffragists of Civil War days gave up their campaign to work for their country, expecting to be enfranchised in return for all their good services. They were told they must wait. Now, in 1917, women, are still waiting. The suffragists of 1917 have read history. They did work for the war and they continued to work for the vote. While women in unprecedented numbers entered war service, standing in for soldiers in factories and on farms, they also held mass meetings, handed out countless leaflets, sponsored parades, plays, lectures, and teas, anything to get the arguments for women's suffrage before the public. One suffragist said, some days I got up at 5.30 and did not get home until midnight, going from office to office, talking the question out. In New York, an eyewitness article stated, 1,030,000 women signed a petition asking for the right to vote. The petitions were pasted on placards born by women marchers in a suffrage parade. The procession of the petitions alone covered more than half a mile. Other suffragists, led by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, turned to the militant tactics of the Women's Party. They picketed outside the White House, keeping their vigil in rain and in cold. Referred to as the Night of Terror, on November 10th, the police arrested 33 women for obstructing traffic. They were imprisoned, beaten, and tortured. One eyewitness described the arrests. An intense silence fell. The watchers saw not only younger women, but white-haired grandmothers hoisted into, the, hoisted into the crowded patrol wagon, their heads erect, and their frail hands holding tightly to the banner until it was wrested from them by brute force. Other suffrage organizations lobbied, appealed to every state and canvassed every legislature, while the White House pickets kept public attention focused on the issue. Finally, in 1917, at the height of the First World War, President Wilson spoke to urge Congress to act on suffrage. This is a people's war. They think that democracy means that women shall play their part alongside men and upon an equal footing with them. If we reject measures like this in ignorant defiance of what a new age has brought forth, 
they will cease to follow us or trust us. In 1917, Jeanette Rankin of Montana became the first woman elected to Congress. The following year, she opened debate on the suffrage amendment. Between January 1918 and June 1919, Congress tried to pass the 19th Amendment five times. Finally, on May 21st, the House passed the amendment. Two weeks later, the Southern Democrats gave up the federal House to the amendment passed the Senate. When the vote was over, the corridor is filled with smiling, happy women. On the way to the elevators, a woman began to sing a familiar hymn with the words of the suffering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all women here below. Despite this momental triumph, this, the suffragists still had much work to do. It took another year before the necessary 36 states would ratify the amendment. Finally, on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment gave women throughout the nation the right to vote. The 36th state was Tennessee. The governor called a special legislative session, which some legislators thought to be unconstitutional. The resolution passed the Senate in a day. In the House, however, there was a bitter fight with a tied vote, 48 to 48. In the final vote, it was Harry Byrne reflecting on a letter from his mother who switched from a nay to a yay vote and the resolution passed. Women's suffrage was won. Harry Byrne's mother wrote, Hurry and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I've been waiting to see how you stood but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cap with her rats. Is she the one who put rat in ratification? Ha, huh. no more for mama at this time. At the last suffrage convention of 1920, Gary Chapman Cat spoke to the joyful women. She said, ours has been a movement with soul ever leading on. Women came, served, and passed on, but others came to take their places. Who shall say that all the hosts of millions of women who have toiled and hoped and met delay are not here today and joining in the rejoicing? Their cause has won. We are gl be glad today. Let the joy be unconfined. Let it speak so clearly that its echo will be heard around the world. Let it find us way, let it find its way into the soul of every woman was longing for the opportunity and liberty still denied her. And let, let your voices, voices ring, ring out, out in the gladness in your hearts. Hearts. 